Love. We're back in the book, the Encyclopedia of Ancient Giants in North America, by Fritz Zimmerman, and forward by L. A. Marsuli. We go to about page 28 of this book. We're going to start with the second part. It says here, legends of an ancient race of giants. Legends, while fanciful stories of the past, are believed to hold kernels of truth. Finding numerous stories that repeat the same tale result in a myth becoming a verifiable history. Native American legends are persistent in telling of an ancient race of human giants that they warred against and eventually vanquished from their lands. A constant theme within the legends are the descriptions of the giants having the white skin with yellow and red hair. All right, they never said anything but the skin. They did say red hair, though. Light-skinned people sometimes referred to as white Indians who were engaged in copper mining and commerce adds additional evidence that migrations of metal traders were coming to North America to exploit and extract the rich copper deposits of Isle St. Royal on Lake Superior for the emerging Bronze Age in the eastern Mediterranean. All right. So, yeah, they were mining all this uh, copper from here. We know we were giving that to the rest of the so-called old world. But again... Nothing about their complexion or skin color it was ever mentioned. Red hair, yes, you know, we've heard about the stories about the red hair uh, giants and everything, but not about uh, their complexion, uh, you know, as he's saying it. Continuous says here, black bearded and red haired giants. Historical collections, Henry Howey, 1888. Although not regarded by the government as reliable, the oral traditions of the native people in the eastern U.S. describe the existence of possibly two races of giants, one supplanting the other by violent means. Here we have the first inkling of some very remote prehistory preserved through the tradition of the Chippewa, Sandusky, and the Tawa tribes, members of the Algonquin language group, the existence of giant bearded men. In this connection, I would say that Mr. Jonathan Brooks, now living in town, stated to me, that his father, Benjamin Brooks, who lived with the Indians 14 years and was well acquainted with their languages and traditions, told him and others that it was a tradition of the Indians that the first uh, tribe occupying this whole country was a black bearded race, very large in size, and subsequently a red bearded race or tribe came and killed or drove off all the black beards, as they called them. All right, so again, as you guys can see, they didn't mention anything about the complexion. They're talking about the color of their hair. In regards to copper mining in the upper Great Lakes, the Chippewa, Indian legends corroborates the theory that these mines were being exploited by a white-skinned people. All right, touch the hijack. Now and long ago, a history of the Marion County area, 1969. James Wofford of the Western Cherokee, who was born in Georgia in 1806, says that his grandmother who must have been born about the middle of the last century, told him that she had heard from the old people that long before her time, a party of giants had once come to visit the Cherokee. They were nearly twice as tall as common men and had their eyes set slanting in their heads so that the Cherokee called them Sunil Kalu, the slant-eyed people, because they looked like the giant hunter Tusul Kalu. 
They said that these giants lived far away in the direction in which the sun goes down. The Cherokee received them as friends, and they stayed some time and then returned to their home in the west. Another god invoked in the hunting songs is Tasul Kalu or Slanting Eyes, a giant hunter who lives in one of the great mountains of the Blue Ridge and owns all the game. Others are the little men, probably the two thunder boys, the little people, the fairies who live in the rock cliffs, and even the De Tasata, a diminutive sprite who holds the place of our puck. One unwritten formula which could not be obtained correctly by dictation was addressed to the red-headed woman whose hair hangs down to the ground. Continuous as legends of traders and copper miners. The strange archaic looking skull was reported as being excavated from a burial mound on Copper Island on the northern part of the Kiwina Peninsula. According to the Chippewa, a white race was driven out far back in the Indian's history. Prehistoric copper mining in the Lake Superior region, 1923. Indian legends make no mention of these mining operations which were of a magnificence and magnitude worthy of being included in the history of any race. The legends do mention that a white race was driven out far back in the Indian's history, all right? So they're mixing a lot of stuff and now they're adding conjectures. The fact that Indian legends indicate the pieces of copper were reserved as manitos or gods would seem to prove that they were not the people who mined and used copper industrially. These prehistoric miners left no records that we can translate to tell who they were. Apparently they did not winter in the region and apparently two none but the hardy and strong made the trip. No graves have been found which can be definitely ascribed to them. They made no drawings, no carvings, and left nothing in the way of mounds, ceremonials, or otherwise to indicate their lineage. The pits and the tools are all they are not enough. Father Alu said that the Indian legends contain no reference to mining or the miners. In fact, the Indians did not know where the mines were. A report of a Chippewa legend says that the old one states that their forefathers drove out a white race who might have been the miners. Who might have been, you see, this is what I've been trying to tell you guys, who might have been that mix in another legend with these copper mines. So they're saying because they have a story of some so-called white race, we got to really hear the story from themselves, right? Now they're saying, oh, they're probably, they're talking about these miners, probably. The story is also told by one of the more respected Native Americans, Joseph Brandt. Not only does he say that the ancient white race established trading in North America, but that they were the builders of the burial mounds and earthworks east of the Mississippi River. Now, I bet you the guy said the red-haired people or giants. He's not talking about what complexion. He also states that this persistent legend was shared by the various tribes east of the Mississippi. The here life of Joseph Brandt, Payan Danega, includes the wars of the American Revolution by William L. Stone, 1838. Among other things relating to the Western countries, says Mr. Woodruff, I was curious to learn in the course of my conversation with Captain Brandt what information he could give respecting the tumuli, which are found on and near the margin of the rivers and lakes from the St. Lawrence to the Mississippi. He stated in reply that the subject had long been agitated, but yet remained in some obscurity. A tradition, he said, prevailed among the different nations of Indians throughout the whole extensive range of country and had been handed down through time immemorial, that in an age long gone by there came white men from a foreign country and by consent of the Indians established trading houses and settlements where these tumuli are found. The expulsion of the giant race from lands that contained the numerous large burial grounds and earthworks seems to have been a source of fear to the natives who never inhabited these lands. Historic Native Americans were not known to have lived in either West Virginia or Kentucky. Hmm. Kentucky was translated as the River of Blood, and the Kanawha River was called by the Shawnee the River of Evil Spirits. Chief Joseph, the chief of the Nez Perce Indians, carried in his medicine bag a clay tablet with cuneiform writing. The tablet was a common receipt for the sale of a lamp. The origin of the tablet is a mystery since the tablet in 1876 as well before cuneiform tablets were available on the market for sale. All right, so they found this here. This is, uh, we mentioned this in other videos. One of those ancient scripts they f have found here. It says Robert Biggs of Chicago dated the tablet to 202 BC, the year that the M. Magalana was installed as high priestess of Nana. History Mysteries, Mary Gindlin. The chief said that the tablet had been passed down in his family for many generations 
and that they had inherited from their white ancestors. Thus the hijack. Chief Joseph said that the white man had come among his ancestors long ago and had taught his people many things. His story echoes those told by Native Americans in both North and South America about white culture bringers, who in this case Joseph had a souvenir to demonstrate the truth of his story. All right, so again, they're adding their whole that, you know, the so-called white people were the civilized, they brought culture, they brought everything, they brought language. These people never said anything but complexions like that. War with the Giants, Prehistoric Men of Kentucky by Colonel Bennett A. Young, 1910. Colonel James Moore of Kentucky was told by an old Indian that the primitive inhabitants of this state had perished in a war of extermination waged against them by the Indians, that the last great battle was fought at the falls of the Ohio, Clarksville, Indiana, and that the Indians succeeded in driving the aborigines into a small island below the rapids, where the whole of them were cut pieces. The colonel was assured that the evidence of this event rested upon facts handed down by tradition and that he would have decisive proofs of it under his eyes as soon as the waters of the Ohio became low. When the waters of the river had fallen, an examination of Sandy Island was made and a multitude of human bones was discovered. There is a similar confirmation of this tradition in the statement of General George Rogers Clark that there was a great berry ground on the northern side of the river but a short distance below the falls. According to a tradition imparted to the same gentleman by the Indian chief Tobacco, the Battle of Sandy Island decided finally the fall of Kentucky with its ancient inhabitants when Colonel McKee commanded in the Kanawha, says Dr. Campbell. He was told by the Indian chief Cornstalk, with whom he had frequent conversations, that Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee also is associated with Kentucky in prehistoric ethnography by Rafinsky, had once been settled by people who were familiar with arts of which the Indians knew nothing, that these, after a series of bloody contests with the Indians, had been exterminated, that the old burial places were the graves of an unknown people, and that the old forts had not been built by Indians but had come down from a very long ago. People who were skilled in the arts, all right? I'm not reading that whole white thing anymore. And again, we're talking about so-called Native Americans, people in the 1800s, 1900s telling these stories. Yeah, they didn't build those forts. In addition to this tradition, testimony, various striking traces of deadly conflict have been found all along the Ohio border. General Clark declares that Kentucky in the language of the Indian signifies the river of blood. Kentucky to the Indian was a land of ill repute and wherever a large fire blazed, strange and unholy rumors were busy with her name. The old Indians who described to Colonel Moore the sanguinary and decisive battle of the Sandy Island expressed great astonishment that people could live in a country which had once been the scene of such conflicts. And an ancient sock who Colonel Joe Hamilton Davis met at St. Louis in 1800 gave utterance to similar expressions of surprise. Kentucky, he said, was filled with ghosts of its slaughtered inhabitants. How could the white man make it its home? All right. So... We're going to read a book about Kentucky in another video I got already here, you know, recording. We're going to definitely read it pretty good with Rafinsky, who they just mentioned here. Continuing in the book, the Encyclopedia of Ancient Giants in North America says here, Centennial History of Miami County, Ohio, 1855. One Indian tradition averts that the primitive inhabitants of Kentucky perished in a war of extermination waged against them by the Red Tribes and the Indian chief Tobacco informed George Rogers Clark of a tradition in which it was stated that there was a battle at Sandy Island which decided the fate of the ancient inhabitants. Chief Cornplanter affirmed that Ohio and this local section as well had once been inhabited by a race who were familiar with the arts of which they, the Indians, knew nothing. For three miles, the beautiful river Ohio in the Indian tongue makes a bend between Jeffersonville, Indiana and Louisville, Kentucky and rushes westward with a terrific roar, inspired by a fall of about 25 feet in the center of the cataract. But the peculiar coincidence is that the left temple of each had been crushed in by some blunt instrument. Whether it was a religious rite or a precaution against burying them alive is a matter of surmise. The writer who opened one of the graves with Professor Green, the eminent geologist at one time, state geologist of Indiana, believes it was a religious rite. The history of Kentucky says when the first 
European settlers arrived at Louisville, they found piles of human skeletons on Corn Island, and some are found there. Now, to the early settlers, it appeared that there had been a great battle fought and that one tribe had been entirely wiped out. All of the skeletons were those of people of medium stature, save one, that of a man, and he must have been seven feet high. On the banks of the falls to this day are found thousands of Indian arrows and spearheads with an occasional battle axe, and once a stone owl was found that had probably been fashioned by one of the prehistoric people. This continues and says here, history, manners, and customs of Indian nations who once inhabited Pennsylvania and the neighboring states by John Hegwelder, 1876. The Lenny Lenape, according to the tradition handed down to them by their ancestors, resided many hundred years ago in a very distant country in the western part of the American continent. We're going to read this in another video I got. For some reason, which I do not find accounted for, they determined on migrating to the eastward and accordingly set out together in a body. After a very long journey and many nights encampments, by the way, they at length arrived on the Namaesi Sipu fish river where they fell in with the Mengwe Iroquois. So we're going to read according to Rapinski that the Lenape and the Mengwe are related, who had likewise emigrated from a distant country just like them and had struck upon the river somewhat higher up. Their object was the same with that of the Delawares. They were proceeding on to the eastward until they should find a country that pleased them. The spies which the Lenape had sent forward for the purpose of reconnoitering had long before their arrival discovered that the country east of the Mississippi was inhabited by a very powerful nation who had many large towns built on the great rivers flowing through their lands. These people, as I was told, called themselves Taligu or Taligewi. Colonel John Gibson, however, a gentleman who has a thorough knowledge of the Indians and speaks several of their languages, is of an opinion that they were not called Taligewi, but Aligewi, and it would seem that he is right from the traces of their name which still remain in the country. The Allegheny River and the mountains having indubitably been named after them. The Delaware still called the former Allegheny Sipu, the river of the Allegheny. We have adopted, I know not for what reason, its Iroquois name, Ohio, which the French had literally translated into La Belle Riviere, the beautiful river. A branch of it, however, still retains the ancient name Allegheny. Many wonderful things are told of this famous people. They are said to have been remarkably tall and stout, and there is a tradition that there were giants among them, people of a much larger size than the tallest of the Lenape. American Antiquarian, 1911. Prehistoric Races of America and Other Lands by Ellis Curry. Dr. Curry was a missionary in the early days in the wilds of Michigan, being one of these missionaries who went among the Indians at Salt St. Mary, among the Chippewas of La Anse and other places in the northern peninsula. He devoted years of time and study to the Indian, and finally learned to comprehend the red man, his ways, his inner life, and the meaning of his traditions, oral history, and religion, as no man ever before him had succeeded in doing. He, early in his career, came to the conclusion that the re that the religion and so-called traditions meant something other than the weird and fancy fight of imagination. But how to obtain the key to the problem involved was itself a problem, which for many years denied his most earnest efforts, but at length he was adopted into one of the tribes to which he was a missionary, and because of this, and in accordance with their unwritten law, he must of necessity be taught the lore of the tribe together with its meaning, as it was interpreted by them. Thus at last was opened to Dr. Curry, the door he had so long striven to unlock, and as he spoke fluently several of the Indian dialects, he encountered no difficulty in understanding their inner meaning. After years spent in attempting to reconcile the apparent contradictions in cosmogony, chronology, ethnology, etc., Dr. Curry, while stationed at Newberry, Michigan, opened for himself a way for the solution of many of the problems that up to that time had defied every scientist and at the same time smoothed out all the apparent inconsistencies. But we shall at this point allow Dr. Curry to speak for himself. An elder brother was the first to give me any light upon the subject. Upon what authority he spoke, I know not. But this I do know, he must have had some good foundation for his statements. He said in substance as follows, 
a very long time ago, a large race of people, all right, lived there as farmers and lumbermen, right? He didn't say white. And a small race who had whiskers came down the Ottawa River from the Northwest and made war on the large race, all right? They had whiskers. So this small race with whiskers made war with the larger race. Again, nobody's talking about complexions and killed most of them. Continuing, says here, history of Fremont County, Iowa, 1881. In 1875, a huge human skeleton was unearthed at a brickyard about one mile east of Hamburg at a depth of 14 feet from the surface of the earth. The bones were, for the most part, in an advanced state of decay, but the teeth were well preserved. The remains are believed to be those of a giant at least eight feet in height. The teeth were worn down almost to the jawbone, which fact indicated that the mighty men of renown must have lived in the days mentioned by the old Indians who formerly lived in the vicinity of Hamburg. Long ago, said they, our fathers used to ride across the Missouri River here on their ponies, for their water was very shallow. And again, I just want to emphasize ponies riding horses. They had horses. The eastern margin of the river then was at the foot of the high bluff at Hamburg, and the river itself was very wide. But there were so many bad men among our fathers in those days, and they engaged in so many wars that the Great Spirit cursed the waters of the river, right? War amongst themselves, many bad people in their in their own tribe. So they were cursed, he says. This is their story, according to the author. So they cursed the waters of the river, the Missouri, and caused it to run in a narrower and deeper channel so that the tribes could not cross and fight and kill one another. After that, our fathers lived till their feet were worn off with walking and their teeth worn down with eating. Many other bones of extinct giant animals and men have been found in the same locality where the skeleton before was described. And we continue, and it says here, fortifying the northern front. New York, <laughs> Cayuga County, notes on the Iroquois, Henry R. Schoolcraft, 1847. Skeletons found about Fort Hill, Auburn, New York, and its vicinity sustained the impression that the former occupants of their military station were of a larger and more powerful race of men than ourselves. I learned that the skeletons generally indicated a stouter and larger frame, a humerus or shoulder bone, of which one has been preserved, may safely be said to be one-third larger or stouter than any now swung by the living. A resident of Batavia, Thomas T. Everett, M.D., has in his cabinet a portion of a lower jaw bone, full one-third larger than any possessed by the present race of men, which was found in a hill near Leroy, some two years since. History of the Holland Purchase, 1849. The ancient works at Fort Hill, Leroy, are especially worthy of observation in connection with this interesting branch of history. Forty years ago, an entrenchment ten feet deep and some twelve or fifteen feet wide extended from the west to the east end along the north or front part and continued up each side about twenty rods, where it crossed over and joining made the circuit of entrenchment complete. It would seem that this fortification was arranged more for protection against invasion from the north, this direction being evidently its most commanding position in the northwest corner. Piles of rounded stones have at different times been collected or hard consistence, which are supposed to have been used as weapons of defense by the besieged against the besiegers. Such skeletons as have been found in and about this locality indicate a race of men averaging one-third larger than the present race, so adjust an anatomist. Says here in the bottom, Green County, Tawanda, New York, Daily Review, April 19, 1916, the grave of a human giant. Visitors go up on Pisgah, all right, Mount Pisgah, like the one Moses went up, almost every pleasant day. Mrs. Atwater, who is still making some improvements, is still there. And Mr. Von Trell of Mansfield is there and drives the team down occasionally for visitors. The Athens Historical Society sent word to the mountain that they would visit it next Saturday. They claimed to know of an Indian grave on top that they would open. The only Indian grave we ever know of there, says the Troy Gazette, was on the south point of the mountain on the farm of Chaz or Charles W. Hooker. A very large thigh bone of a human being was dug up 45 years ago at the point near the spring. It was of immense size, and on its being shown to Dr. Theodore Wilder, he said it must have belonged to a man seven feet high. 
there were giants in those days. All right, so seven feet, yeah, to a short person that's like five five, yeah, that's a giant, right? But you know, Shag is like seven feet, so we still got giants amongst us, you know. It's here, Jefferson County. Seven enclosures were mapped in Jefferson County, New York. Large skeletal remains were found in abundance within the county. A descriptive work on Jefferson County, New York, 1898, Aboriginal Traces. In Rodman are still discernible traces of the Indian occupation near the residence of Edward Dillon, formerly Jared Freeman, and so marked on the accompanying diagram, is an interesting Aboriginal work. It is located on lot number one on the farm of the late Royal Fuller and a gently sloping field near a small tributary of Stony Creek. A plan of this work was made in 1850 under the direction of Mr. Freeman, who was familiar with it when every part was distinctly visible and the following description was then made. It consists of a double bank with an intervening crescent-shaped space and a short bank running down to the stream. The latter may have been the remains of a beaver dam or a covered way to the water. Beaver dams were common on the stream, but this had not their general appearance. Within the enclosure, there was plowed up a large quantity of corn, which was found scattered over an area about one rod by eight rods. It appeared as if charred by fire or exposure to the elements. This spot must have been an immense cache or place for concealing corn, and all several hundred bushels were revealed by the plow. Shard corn was not found elsewhere, though adjoining fields furnished large quantities of stoneware and earthenware fragments. Just inside the enclosure is a large boulder of Naeus rock, in which may be seen two or three broad yet shallow depressions, doubtless worn by grinding stone implements. These smooth depressions were 12 inches across and from one to two inches deep. No other part of the mass presented a light smooth surface. Directly upon the mound stood a pine stump three feet in diameter. All right, it says here Madison County. History of Madison County, New York, 1872. Indian relics were so abundant and graves so numerous that it is believed there must have been a great battle fought here in the ages past. Beads could be picked up here and there in considerable quantities. Hatchets, axes, and many other curious relics are scattered about having been covered with the accumulating soil of ages and which the husbandman's plow brings to the surface. Curiosity seekers have carried off many of these relics, but there is, however, now and then an instance where they are allowed to remain, more than a mile on the road northeast of Muntsville Depot. In the woods, there is an Indian skull lying partly exposed among the rubbish of the woods. Several individuals are now living who noticed the same skull 30 years ago. It is in an out-of-the-way place. It has remained undisturbed till the present time. Some of the skeletons found in these burial grounds are of extraordinary size. One gentleman remarked that he took one of the large jaw bones and found it sufficiently ample to cover his own lower jaw. Another person stated that he took one of the skulls from which the base had decayed and found he could place it with ease over the outside of his own head. All right, another uh, report here says, Our County and Its People, Madison County, New York, 1899. Forty years ago, the hill known as Pines Hill and celebrated as the great council ground of the Onedas was covered with dense wilderness, save a small spot covered with a dense wilderness on the summit, comprising an area of about half an acre and in the shape of a complete circle, bordered all around with a thick growth of shrubs consisting of alders, wild plums and hazels. On the east was a narrow place of entrance, of barely sufficient width to admit two persons abreast. Not far from this entrance place and within the area was a circle of earth of some 20 feet in diameter, which was raised about two above the general level and covered with fine coals, having the appearance of a coal pit bottom of present day. The remainder of this oasis in the wilderness was overgrown in the summer with wild grass, wild flowers and weeds, and appeared as of a tree had never encumbered it since the dawn of creation. When or by whom this spot was cleared is not known, nor will it ever be known. The face of the earth around indeed indicates it has once been peopled with a race of considerably advanced civilization. 
Within a radius of three miles from this spot are found graves with trees growing over them, so that the roots spread from head to foot. A great many of these graves were some years since excavated and found to contain various bones, and in some cases entire skeletons of a people of giant proportions, the skull and jawbones of which would cover the head and face of the most fleshy persons of our day. Continuing, it says here, Niagara County. History of Niagara County, New York, 1878. About one and a half miles west of Shelby Center, Orleans County, is an ancient work. A broad dish is enclosed in a form nearly circular about three acres of land. The dish is, at this day, well defined, several feet deep. Some skeletons, almost entire, have been exhumed, many of giant size, not less than seven to eight feet in length. The skulls are large and well developed in the anterior lobe, are broad between the ears and flattened in the coronal region. Let's hear history of Niagara County, New York, 1878, town of Cambria. A search enabled them to come to a pit, but a slight distance from the surface. The top of the pit was covered with slabs of the Medina sandstone and was 24 feet square by four and a half in depth, the plains agreeing with the four cardinal points. It was filled with human bones of both sexes and all ages. They dug down at one extremity and found the same layer to extend to the bottom, which was the same dry loam. And from their calculations, they deduced that at least 4,000 souls had perished one great massacre. And one skull, two flint arrowheads were found, and many had the appearance of having been fractured and cleft open by a sudden blow. They were piled in regular layers, but with no regard to size or sex. 150 persons a day visited this spot the first season and carried off the bones. They are now nearly all gone and the pit plowed over. The remains of a wall were traced near the vault. There was even a wall here. You guys hear that? Some of the bones found in the latter were of unusual size. One of these was a thigh bone that had been healed of an oblique fracture. One was the upper half of a skull so large that of a common man would not fill it. All right? This is what they're finding. This is what they took and destroyed. Orleans County. Pioneer history of Orleans County, New York, 1871. About one and a half miles west of Shelby Center in Orleans County is an ancient work. A broad ditch encloses and forms nearly circular, about three acres of land. The ditch is, at this day, well defined several feet deep. Adjoining the spot of the south is a swamp, about a mile in width by two in length. This swamp was once, doubtless, if not a lake, an impassable morass. From the interior of the enclosure made by the ditch, there is what appears to have been a passageway on the side next to the swamp. No other breach occurs in the entire circuit of the embankment. They are accumulated within and near this fort, large piles of small stones of size, convenient to be thrown by the hand or with a sling. Arrowheads of flints are found in or near the enclosure in great abundance, stone axes, etc. Trees of 400 years growth stand upon the embankment and underneath them have been found earthenwares, pieces of plates or dishes, rods with skill, presenting ornaments in relief of various patterns. Some skeletons almost entire have been exhumed, many of giant size, not less than seven or eight feet in length. The skulls are large and well developed in the anterior lobe, broad between the ears and flattened in the coronal region. St. Lawrence County, History of St. Lawrence and Franklin Counties, New York, 1856. In the town of Macomb, St. Lawrence County are found traces of three trench enclosures and several places where beds of ashes mark the site of ancient hearse. One of these was on the farm of William Houghton on the bank of Birch Creek and enclosed the premises now used as a mill yard. It is somewhat in the form of semicircle, the two ends resting on the creek. It might have enclosed half an acre on an adjoining hill now partly occupied by an orchard. Traces of an ancient work formerly existed, but this has also been obliterated. In the pond adjoining there was found many years since a skeleton said to have been of great size. Says here, Pennsylvania, Erie County. History of Erie County, Pennsylvania, 1884. On the John Pomeroy Place, upon the second flat of Conneaut Creek, are the traces of an ancient mound, such as exists in Gerard Springfield, Harbor Creek, 
Fairview, Wayne, and other townships of the county. It is circular in form, enclosed in about three-fourths of an acre. The embankment, when the country was cleared up, was about three feet high by six feet thick at the base, with large trees growing upon it. One of these trees, a mammoth oak, when cut down, indicated by its strength an age of 500 years. Beneath the tree, the skeleton of a human being was taken up, which measured 11 feet from head to foot. The jawbone easily covered that of a man who weighed over 200 pounds, and the lower bone of the leg, being compared with that of a person who was 6 feet 4 inches in height, was found to be nearly a foot longer. Another circle of a similar character existed on the Taylor Farm, now owned by J.L. Strong. Continue says, History of Erie County, Pennsylvania, Illustrated, 1884. Many indications have been found in the county proving conclusively that it was once peopled by a different race from the Indians who were found here when it was first visited by European men. When the link of the Erie and Pittsburgh Railroad from the Lakeshore Road to the dock at Erie was in the process of construction, the laborers dug into a great mass of bones at the crossing of the public road, which runs by the rolling mill. From the promiscuously way in which they were thrown together, it is surmised that a terrible battle must have taken place at some day, so far distant that not even a tradition of the event has been preserved. The skulls were flattened and the foreheads were seldom more than an inch in width. The bodies were in a sitting posture and were no traces that garments, weapons, or ornaments had been buried with them. On account of the superstitious notions that prevailed among the workmen, None of the skeletons were preserved, the entire collection, as far as was exposed, being thrown into the embankment further down the road. At a later date, when the farm was being widened, another deposit of bone was dug up and summarily disposed of as before. Among the skeletons was one of a giant, side by side with a smaller one, probably that of his wife. The arm and leg bones of this native American Goliath were about one half longer than the tallest man among the laborers. The skull was immensely large. The lower jawbone easily slipped over the face and whiskers of a full-faced man. The teeth were in a perfect state of preservation. Another skeleton was dug up in Connaught Township some years ago, which was quite remarkable in its dimensions. As in the other instance, a comparison was made with the largest man in the neighborhood, and the jawbone readily covered his face while the lower bone of his leg was nearly a foot longer than the one with which it was measured, indicating that the man must have been 8 to 10 feet in height. All right, 8 to 10 feet in height. The bones of a flathead were turned up in the same township some two years ago with a skull of unusual size. Continuous says here, History of Erie County, Pennsylvania, Illustrated, 1884, an ancient graveyard was discovered in 1820 on the land known as the Doctors Carter and Dickinson Places in Erie, which created quite a sensation at the time. Dr. Albert Tyre dug up some of the bones and all indicated a race of beings of immense size. Greenville Advance Argus, Greenville, Pennsylvania, June 11, 1885. Giant human skeletons found. J.H. Porter has a farm near Northeast Erie County, Pennsylvania not many miles from where the Lakeshore Railroad crosses the New York State boundary line. This week, some workmen in Mr. Porter's employ came upon the entrance to a cave, and on entering it found heaps of bones within. Many skeletons were complete and exhibited to the naturalists and archaeologists of the neighborhood. They informed the wandering bystanders that the remains were unmistakably those of giants. The entire village of Northeast was aroused by the discovery and Sunday, hundreds of people from Erie took advantage of their holiday visit to the scene. It was at first conjectured that the remains were those of soldiers killed in battle with Indians that abounded in the vicinity during the last century. But the size of the skulls and the length of the leg bones dispelled the theory. So far, about 150 giant skeletons of powerful proportions have been exhumed, and indications point to a second cave eastward which may probably contain as many more. Scientists who have exhausted skeletons and made careful measurements of the bones say they are of a race of gigantic creatures compared with which our tallest men would appear as pygmies. 
there are now arrowheads, stone hatches, or other implements of war with the bodies. Some of the bones are on exhibition at various stores. One is as thick as a good-sized bucket. The here, Ohio. Historical Collections of Ohio, Howie, Volume 1, 1847, Ashtabula County, Ohio. There were mounds situated in the village of Conant and an extensive burying ground near the Presbyterian Church, which appeared to have had no connection with the burying places of the Indians. Among the human bones found in the mounds were some belonging to men of gigantic structure. Some of the skulls were of sufficient capacity to admit the head of an ordinary man and jawbones that might have been fitted over the face with equal facility. The other bones were proportionally large. The burying ground referred to contain about four acres, and with the exception of a slight angle in conformity with the natural contour of the ground was in the form of an oblong square. It appeared to have been accurately surveyed into lots running from north to south, and exhibited all the order and propriety of arrangement deemed necessary to constitute Christian burial. On the first examination, the settlers, they found it covered with ordinary forest trees. The graves were distinguished by slight depressions deposed in straight rows and were estimated to number from two to three thousand. On examination in 1800, they were found to contain human bones, invariably blackened by time, which on exposure to the air soon crumbled to dust. Traces of an ancient cultivation observed by the first settlers on the lands of the vicinity, although covered with forests, exhibited signs of having once been thrown up into squares and terraces and laid out into gardens. And down here says a history of Ashtabula County, Ohio, 1878. And excavating the grounds for graves, it is said that bones have been exhumed, which seem to have belonged to a race of giants. This land at one time belonged to a Mr. Peglick Sweet, who was a man of large size and full features. It is narrated at one time he and Diggin came upon his skull and jaw, which were of such size that the skull would cover his head and the jaw could be easily slipped over his face, as though the head of a giant were enveloping his the graves were distinguished by slight depressions in the surface of the earth, disposed in straight rows, which with intervening spaces or valleys covered the entire area. The number of these graves has been estimated at being between two and three thousand. What? You guys hear that? Two or three thousand graves alone. Come on now. Two old world here. Aaron Wright Esquire in 1800 made a careful examination of these depressions and found them invariably to contain human bones blackened with time, which upon exposure to the air soon crumbled to dust. Some of these bones were of unusual size and evidently belonged to a race allied to giants. Skulls were taken from these mounds and cavities of which were of sufficient capacity to admit the head of an ordinary man and jawbone that might be fitted over the face with equal facility. The bones of the upper and lower extremities were of corresponding size. All right. And that's the end of this part, guys. We read a lot and, you know, a lot of pretty good, interesting information to follow up on. But again, more corroboration, more reports, more historical accounts of giant skeleton bones being found all over North America. So I hope you guys enjoyed the second part of uh, this book. You know, we had to dodge the hijack a lot in the beginning with his old white uh, race thing. But as you guys saw, we started reading actual historical reports. They weren't talking about complexion. You know, you can't tell complexion just because you find red hair. I just want to tell you guys, red hair does not automatically mean pale skin. With that said, I'm not going to deny that there was probably all kinds of shades of giants. You know, like light-skinned giants, dark-skinned giants. People tend to generalize when they write these books. And this is a modern book, a modern author. But... We still appreciate how you put all these reports together so we can follow up on them. And this matches the newspaper articles uh, we read from Analog, from Twitter. Shout out to Analog. Because many people in the world know about the ancient giants that were found all over the Americas here. Thanks for sticking around through this whole chapter in this book, uh, hearing me read. Appreciate you guys always. 
Shout out to my Patreons. I appreciate you guys. Shout out to the Telegram back chat. I also want to say, guys, I got my Instagram page back. I just decided to start it up again, you know, start fresh. And I did do a couple of posts today, you know, just to get it started. But I plan to, you know, update it every day with new images and new things as we go along in this journey. So if you'd like to help me rebuild, make sure to follow me on Instagram. As you guys can see, Kurimel underscore how it says official IG page with this image. Follow and share. Thanks a lot. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Hawaii.